Oh, well, howdy doody, everybody. How you doing? All right, good. Well, we, uh, last weekend I was over in Vallejo at our second campus now, and I preached there. It was really good, yeah. So Noah, Pastor Noah, and a chunk of our staff and a chunk of our greeter team are all over there, and they're, they just, I think they just got done with service. So I texted Noah and said, how did it go? Oh, hey, let's find out. He said, great, with an exclamation point. So we're good. If you have your Bible, Luke chapter 5, verse 1, I'm going to pray, but before I do that, I have two announcements that I want, I want you to really pay attention to. If you're a dude, a guy, a bro, or just a man, so if you qualify in that, raise your hand if, that's, if, you're, if you're in that. Okay. Our men's camp is coming up our, our, in Tahoe. Now, I need you to understand something. You might be new and you think, oh, a men's camp. I don't want to go to men's camp. Guys in a big, ca- no, we're all, we, we rent a bunch of cabins. You're with like seven, eight guys in a big cabin, and you get good food. I'm going to speak. Pastor Ray Larson, who spoke here a couple months ago, he's going to speak. We're going to golf. We're going to have a great time. I think some guys are going mountain biking. Uh, so if you're by a guy, even if you don't know him, just go like this to him and say, dude, go to men's camp. Come on, do it. There it is. There it is. Ladies, release your man. The second thing is, the second thing is, we have um, pulled the trigger on remodeling our bathrooms. And uh, yes, great guy in our church who owns a company. They do incredible work. He was actually on a TV show. Uh, not to one of them, like uh, you know, Home Improvement, build it something. I don't know. I don't. How many of you watch Home Improvement shows? Okay, I won't say anything then. But anyways. <laughs> So we have pulled the trigger because we have a pastor's conference coming up in September that we want our bathrooms to be ready for. And so we need your help because how many know bathrooms aren't cheap? How many of you were going to redo your bathroom at home? It would cost you a little bit of money. Quadruple that with the size of our bathrooms. This is not a fresh paint job and this is a gut. We're gutting them. All new, everything that's in there will be gone. So if you want to give to it, put bathroom on your check. Uh, or uh, bathroom, when you, if you want to give online with a credit card, just put bathroom. Amen? When you, how many of you just appreciate the bathrooms? I saw what they're going to look like. I said, I want my office in here. This is going to be amazing. They look incredible. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. We're in a series. It's called Called Forward. And today we're talking about called forward into the deep. How many want to go into the deep? Well, you might, you might, you might not whoop when you find out what the deep is. All right. Father, would you bless the word of God today? Thank you for Vallejo and all that you did there this morning. Jesus, come and rule and reign here. May the Holy Spirit of God fill this place and fill our hearts. Teach us the word of God and challenge us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you will know this story. It's, it's, a, it's a real famous part of, of um, Scripture, Luke 5, verse 1. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him, they're talking about Jesus, to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake And saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put it out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night, we've caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. You will be a fisher of men. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. I have a question for you. We're going to be in that text, by the way, today. What does it mean when Jesus, because a lot of Christians, we like to stay on the shallow shores of Christianity. I'm not going to go too deep. And Jesus comes to Peter and says, Hey, Come out into the deep. Launch out into the deep for a catch. Now, these were professional fishermen. They had caught nothing all night. And they had already put their stuff away. And Jesus says, can I borrow your boat? And he goes, sure. sure." And he puts it out from the water. And Simon's listening to Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, you want to catch something? 
go out in the deep, deep and, and let down your nets. And they catch so many fish, their boat sinks, starts to sink. The other guys have to come over and start taking fish. Their boat starts to sink. How many of you know that God wants to sink your life with, with abundance? And I don't mean that in a prosperity gospel teaching kind of way. I mean that in just the fruitfulness of the kingdom of God in your life. He wants to, he wants to sink you down, load you up with the fruit of who he is. But you can't go there if you just stay on the shallows. If you're just comfortable with church as usual, I just go to Sundays, don't bother me, I don't want to do anything else, you'll never be this kind of Christian. So what does it mean to be a deep Christian, first of all? What does it mean to go deep? And I'm going to change the word deep to the word mature. What does it mean to be a mature Christian? Because today, and in charismatic circles, which we are, if you're new here today, we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the power of God. We believe nothing has diminished, nothing has left. God wants to give it to the church. But sometimes in the charismatic movements, we can take and say, well, that person's deep. And you say, well, why are they deep? Well, because they had this experience or this manifestation happened in their life. They got chicken skin when they worshiped. How many of you ever do that? You're in here worshiping and you, you know, you get the little cold chills, the little chicken skin, you're like, Ooh, the Lord is so good. Is that deep Christianity? I think it's awesome when God does those things, but in order to be a deep believer, I believe out of this text, there are four things that we have to walk in to be a mature believer, to be a mature Christian. I'm going to go through them. Are you ready? Wow, that was overwhelmingly like, <laughs> and the crowd goes mild on everybody. <laughs> Number one, the first thing you have to ha have if you're going to be a deep believer, a mature Christian, is you have to walk in the depths of obedience. You have to be an obedient Christian. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Watch what he says. If you love me, you're going to obey me. And so many Christians, especially now in some of the stuff we preach that's probably not scriptural, I do whatever I want, I go to church, I feel good, I've got Jesus, and I got my foot in the world, I've got one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom, and Jesus said, if you love me, the result of your love for me is that you're going to obey me. Amen. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, I don't think you're quite sure. 1 Samuel 15, 22 is a great portion of scripture where God speaks to Saul and he says, Saul, this nation, this city, I want you, to, now this will blow some of your minds if you're new in church. God says to him, I want you to go there. I want you to destroy all of them, kill everybody, even their animals. People go, wow, God would be so mean. This was a very wicked city that God had had patience with and patience with, patience with. They were sacrificing their children to demons, throwing them into the fire. These were a brutal people, and the Lord said, I've had enough. Go take them out. And Saul goes, okay. And he goes, and he takes them out, but he walks in partial obedience. He spares the life of one man. And he takes all their sheep because he's like, these are good-looking sheep. Why should we kill them? They're going to work good for us. And watch what the prophet says. Samuel says this to Saul. In 1 Samuel 15, 23, 22, he says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. To be an obedient Christian, the Lord's looking for people that will be obedient to him. That when he asks them to do something, they don't just partially do it. I remember I told this story probably years ago. Uh, how many remember Circuit City? How many remember that place that went bankrupt? Amazon. It's killing everybody, right? It's just taking all these businesses down. I remember uh, the Lord spoke to Cindy and I. We were in debt. How many have ever been in debt? We were young and in debt, not a lot of debt, really seriously, com you know, compared to a lot. And the Lord said, get out of debt. And so we were like, all right, Lord, we're going to get out of debt. Well, I was going to Circuit City. My friend managed the, the Circuit City there. He said, hey, Pastor Rick. I go, what's up, man? He goes, I got this crazy deal on this surround sound system for your house if you want it. This guy brought it back. It's flawless, man. I'll give you a killer deal. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so what did I pull out? My credit card, put it on there, and I was like, sweet, got it home, set it up perfectly. You know how you run the wires? And 
under the carpet. And I sat down and I watched like Rambo 2, Rambo 3, Rambo 8, Rocky. And then Cindy's in bed and like bullets are flying around. And I'm like, this is amazing. And I shut it off. And in the stillness of shutting it off, I literally heard the Lord, not, not audibly in my heart, say, what are you doing? And so I'm watching a movie. <laughs> do you want to watch another movie, Lord? Because I'll, I'll do it. Don't, don't tempt me. I'll do it. And the Lord said, I thought I told you to get out of debt. And I went, oh. But God, it was such a good deal. <laughs> Isn't that funny how we do that? We reason out like, but the sheep are so great. So I went back to Circuit City with that box. I walk in, my buddy's working. Hey, dude, what's up, man? Is it broke? No. I put it down on the counter. He looks at me and he goes, the Lord? And I said, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the oh Lord. Sorry. God bless you, man. If you're gonna be a, if you're gonna be a really fruitful Christian in the kingdom and be mature and deep, you have to be obedient. It's it's a priority. Because Peter was like, I don't want to go back out there because I've already done this. Nevertheless, at your word I'll go. And it took obedience to say when Jesus said, "Can I borrow your boat?" Yes. Launch into the deep. Okay, I'll go into the deep. It takes obedience, amen? amen? Number two, we have to walk in the depths of the word. And I know I've never preached to this church before about the Bible and the word. Oh, I bored many of you. In verse five, Peter says to Jesus, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down my net. At your what? A lot of us do things where we don't have a word from the Lord, and then we suffer the consequences, and then we get mad at the Lord. You ever done that? So God's calling us to step out as a church, and you as a, as a, as a, as a, a person, to step out in faith and do things, but you need to understand the word so that you know how to walk out what he's asking you to do. Remember those guys on the news? You'll hear about them. They're like, yeah, God told me to go kill my neighbor. You ever seen these freaks? How many of you know if you knew your Bible, you would say, huh, been looking for that scripture. <laughs> you got to walk in the depths of the word. You got to know the word of God. Or how about this one? I've had a really bad marriage for 10, 15 years, and this guy is so nice to me. He makes me feel good. He says sweet things to me. And the Lord, oh, this is when I always get nervous. And the Lord said, He's my soulmate, and he's going to make me happy. And I go, hmm, let's find that verse. <laughs> Got news for you, it's not in there. See, if we don't let the word of God really be the rudder of our hearts and of our lives, we will drive our lives into the ditch. Because of feelings, I thought, Whenever anybody says to me, I feel, I think, I always go, hmm, what do you feel and think? Well, this is what the Lord said. Do you have scripture to back that up? Because at his word, we move at his word, right? We don't move at just our feelings all the time. If God speaks to me or I feel something, I always go, is that in the word? Is that something I can back up with scripture? Amen. John 1 says this. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word... So all the way back in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. This is talking about Jesus. Did you know that when Jesus returns, in the book of Revelation, when Jesus comes back, that written on His thigh is the words, the Word of God. So when people say, you shouldn't have a tattoo, I go, I don't know. Amen, tattooers out there? Yeah. Don't be ashamed. The Word of God. You see, because Jesus was the uncreated God who, in Genesis chapter 1, spoke all things to existence by the power of His Word. The Bible says that He holds all things together. In Colossians, it says that Jesus holds all things together. He's Lord of, of gravity. He's Lord of the birds. He's Lord of trees. He's the Lord of everything. If He wanted to say no gravity, there would be no gravity. If He went, no gravity, 
be weird. We'd all be like, what's going on, right? You see, when, when, when Peter stepped out in obedience to the word of God, what happened? A harvest came. Why? He toiled all night, caught nothing, but when God got involved, he got a harvest. Why? Because Jesus is Lord of the fish. He was like, oh, I toiled all night and I didn't catch nothing. Well, go back out again. Go do it. I don't want to do this. I just put the nets away. All right, at your word. And the Lord said, hey, fish, come on, get into the net. I don't want to go in the net. (laughs) Fills up the whole thing. You see, when you follow Jesus and stop following you, and you start being obedient to the word of God, I'm not telling you life's going to be smoking easy. But I'm going to tell you that there'll be fruit that you can't produce on your own. Get into the word. Amen? All right. By the way, when I say get into the word, I mean read it. I mean read it. And I also mean there's tons of resources out there. Go buy a Bible concordance and start looking up words and scriptures and start studying it. Now, don't overstudy it. I know people who overstudy. It's like this. If I said to my wife who's on the front row who's beautiful, if I, I just wanted to let you know. If I said to her, Cindy, I love you, and she was like, wow, you love me? I'm going to go study what you just said to me. I, I'm going to go study in the Greek. By the way, I took hermeneutics in Bible college, how to study the Bible 14,000 ways and how to break down Greek and the Hebrew and all that stuff. The word I, I'm going to go study the word I for two hours. Oh, wow, so deep. <laughs> love, ooh. You, ooh, you study so much that you forget that I love you. You see, I've seen people study the word. I've sat in, ver- in, in sermons where guys have been four hours and two verses about do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And when they got done, I walked up to him and said, well, it's cool. It's really deep. So let me get this straight. The point is do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's the point. Well, you, man, you took a long time to get there. <laughs> Just read it and say, yes. The Bible says he loves me. Well, then I, he loves me. He's lavish love on me. I receive it. The Bible says, don't sleep with your boyfriend or girlfriend before marriage. Okay, I won't. I won't overstudy it so I can find a loophole out of it. Come on. People do it. I hear these pastors, well, that's not really what. You know, the Greek, you know, the Greek. And I'm like, dude, stop. <laughs> Just let the sword pierce you when it needs to pierce you. Stop running from it. Just let the word of God do what it's called to do so that you can become all that he wants you to be. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. All right. There we go. <laughs> Number three, we're called to the depths of action. Watch this. Let's go back and just review it real fast. The depths of obedience, we must obey. We must know the word of God so we know what we're obeying and how to obey. And then we need to have the depths of action in our life where we actually do it and we don't just study it. Remember the guy that said, you know, um, go clean your room to the kids. Hey, go clean your room. Person goes away, comes back, the room's not clean. Dad says, what happened? Why didn't you clean your room? Well, I studied what you said to me. I studied the words, all of it, in the Greek. Go clean your room. It's powerful what you said. (laughs) Come back two days later, still not clean. What happened? Dad, I had a Bible study, and a bunch of us got together and dissected what you said. And it is even more powerful. (laughs) But you never actually get to clean the room because you're too busy studying and never doing. Amen? So... The depths of action. And the Bible says this, that when Peter went out on the water, it says when they had done this, when they had done it, when they took the time to go out into the deep and they took the time to let down the nets, when they had done this, that's when a harvest came. We want the boat to just be sitting on the lake in the shallows and then the Lord just calls fish and they just dive into the boat. And we show up the next morning and the fish are all just waiting in the boat. Hey, how's it going? God would never do that because he wants you to be part of the miracle. 
So you have to do, and in James chapter 2, they're talking about when you see your brother in need and you don't help him. Watch this in the context, James 2, verse 16. And one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. You have to move out. Knowledge likes to talk about it. Faith does it. That's what the Pharisees didn't like about Jesus. Look right here. That's what the Pharisees hated about Jesus. They hated him because all they wanted to do was sit around in their religious garb and study 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 and talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And Jesus shows up on the scene and he starts doing it. He starts casting out demons. He starts healing the sick. He starts preaching the good news to the poor. And they didn't like it. Why? Because knowledge just wants to talk about it, but God wants to actually do it. Amen? I don't want to be a Pharisee. How about you? I don't want to be a Pharisee. All we do is sit around. I know people sit around and study the Bible. They know more than I do. They really do. They're, they're geniuses in Scripture, but they don't do nothing. And they, they think like all this knowing is profiting them something. And it doesn't until you do it. How many of you know that uh, my dad was a master mechanic? I've told you before. He could rebuild an engine in a white tuxedo and never get it dirty. The guy was unbelievable. All the man tools, you know, the big toolboxes with all the stuff. And I have one little bag at my house, right? My dad would be so disappointed. He would, I would watch him restore a Mustang, and he would be working on the engine, and he would wipe a tool, put it back, do something, grab the same tool he just grabbed. And, do this and wipe it again. And, and they, it was meticulous and beautiful. And I had a friend who thought he knew stuff about cars. And I started having a problem with my car. Carburetor's doing something weird. And he goes, well, let me look at it. I said, well, why, why should you look at it? He goes, well, I've read up. I've, I have the manual for the book, for the, for the carburetor. I'm like, well, dude, my dad has probably built hundreds and hundreds of carburetors. Why, why would I have you, who's just read the book, when I can have my dad who's actually done it. You see, God's calling us to read it and to do it. Amen? You got to do it. You got to jump into the depths of action. There you go. Watch this, Luke 17, verse 14, when Jesus was, he healed the 10 lepers. Watch what it says. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were healed. They weren't healed in the moment. As they went. They had to do something. We're going to go show ourselves to the priest. And the one guy turns around. He looks at the one guy who had leprosy all over him and goes, wow, your face is healed. And then he ran back to thank Jesus, and the rest of them just went on their way. As you go, God meets you. Sometimes he asks you to do stuff before you see the results. I would say most of the time, for me anyways. The last one, number four. We have to walk in the depths of humility. We have to be humble before the Lord. Look what happens to Simon Peter when after this great catch comes, he, look, look what it says in verse eight. It says, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. Watch. An encounter with God will always bring the, a, a sense of I am undone. When it's really God that's saving you, and it's really God that's meeting with you, there will be a sense of, oh, I'm not worthy, because that's what happened to Peter. He was like, I've never had a catch like this before. This is unreal. There's something behind this that's amazing. And when he looked at Jesus, he, he was so blessed by, because, hey, guys, he was a fisherman. How many of you know that was money that just filled up his boat? This was not, a, this, was, this was a big deal. And he comes to the Lord, and he gets down, and he says, Lord, just get away from me. I'm a sinner. How many sinners are in the house today? Oh, thank God. <laughs> if you don't know you're a sinner, then you probably haven't had the Lord reveal to you how sinful you are. If you think, well, I'm saved. Yeah, I accepted Jesus as my Savior, but I'm not that bad. How many know you're bad? How many know left to yourself, you're in trouble? I'm going to think crazy things. I'm going to do crazy things. I'm going I'm to violate God in a hundred different ways. So he humbles himself and comes to the Lord and says, oh, God, just depart from me. And look what Jesus says. Don't be afraid. Isn't that cool? Don't be afraid. 
Peter, your life is about to radically change. Because you obeyed me, because in humility you understand who you are, that you're not that good, I'm changing your destiny. I'm taking you from a man who used to fish for fish, and now I'm going to make you a fisher of men that's going to impact the world for all eternity. Isn't that crazy cool? So if you'll humble yourself, if you'll have a humble life, some people have this attitude like, oh, thank God that God got me. He's so privileged to have me on his team. I'm so good. I'm handsome. I'm beautiful. Whatever your thing is, it's, the Lord is so privileged to have me. He loves you and wants you, but he doesn't need you. Isn't that crazy? He spoke through a donkey in the Old Testament. That's every time I get up to preach, I go, well, Lord, you did speak through a donkey, so you're, you, can, you can use me too. He wants you. He loves you. But to, to get done what he needs to get done, he doesn't need you, but he choo- chooses to, to partner with us. And that should bring a sense of humility of like, oh, God, I'm undone. When Isaiah saw the Lord, I want to show it to you real quick, Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 7. I'm not going to read it all. Here's what he, when he saw the Lord, the prophet Isaiah, he says, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Wow. They toiled all night, but when they saw Jesus, things changed. How many of you have toiled at something for a long time and it hasn't changed? How many of you love to fish? How many fishermen do we have out there and women do we have out there? Come on. Oh, wow, you're lonely. You're lonely today. First, the first service, there was a lot of fishermen in there. Maybe because they like to get up early. I don't know. I hated fishing. My dad used to, we lived out in the country. My dad used to wake us boys up on Saturday morning. We're going fishing, boys. Ah, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. We're going to drive an hour to Grace Lake, it was called. There was no grace there. And he would, you know, I'm like seven, and he's like, shh, got to be quiet, you're going to scare the fish. What are the fish afraid of? (laughs) Really, my voice is going to scare them? And there we'd sit, just, oh. And I would think of my bobber, oh, my bobber moved, nothing. My dad would get mad, son, you got to leave it just sitting there. I'm like, dad, I don't want to leave it sitting there, I'm bored. I don't like fishing, but I love catching. When the fish are on, it's like, yeah, yeehaw. Problem was, in our house, that was pretty rare. We just sit there and just bored. We toiled and had a fruitless life. How many of you dread having a fruitless life? Did you know that they put in research out that men, once they get 50 and older... By the way, that's not old. (laughs) It's not old at all. That men stop thinking about what they can obtain and they start thinking about legacy that they're going to leave. And there's some of you that can toil. You're toiling and toiling and toiling to build something and it's actually just worthless, really, in the end of the day. Not everything, but a lot of the stuff I think we're building is just, it's, it's pretty empty. How many of you have toiled at your marriage for 15 years and you're done and you're tired and you're done with it? Don't raise your hand. How many of you (laughs) sitting next to the guy, this guy right here is driving me crazy. (laughs) How many of you have toiled at overcoming that addiction 10, 15 years? How many of your children, you've toiled, you've toiled, you've toiled? It's time to hear what the Lord's saying about it and do what he's saying about it. Because you've done enough in your own strength, you can't do it. You can't get the harvest to come. But if you'll listen to the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he speaks and you go, okay, I'm going to go do that. And I'm not going to have partial obedience in it. If you say do it, I'm doing it. I'm going to go all out. If you're telling me the guy I'm dating right now isn't the guy I'm supposed to be dating, then I'm going to let that person go. And then some of you in here right now are going, what? What? Because all they're doing is they're not filling your boat. They're poking holes in the bottom of the ship, and you're just bloop, 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 bloop. 
God's plan for you is to be fruitful. I'm going to give you four really fast things. And some of you go, oh my gosh, you got four more points? No, they're fast, trust me. <laughs> Here's the dangers of living in the shallows of Christianity, of never going into the deep. Here's the dangers of it. Number one, we rarely see the miraculous hand of God. You won't see it. Number two, we're rarely part of the catch and the harvest. You won't, you won't see the harvest and the catch that God wants to do. Three, we, we rarely bless other people. The sign of an immature Christian is that we don't bless people. And four, we never fulfill our purpose. Peter went from this. Can you imagine what heaven's like for Peter? He's all over scripture. We read him for thousands of years. People are learning from his life. He's been, a, he's been catching men with his stories and his life for thousands and thousands of years. God wants to use you powerfully, but you have to get out of the shallows of just normal Christianity where you just feel like you're okay. Just enough Jesus to get by. Just enough Jesus to get to heaven. Just enough Jesus to make sure I'm okay. But then I'm going to do what I want in these areas of my life. No. When we yield the boat of our life, we get fruit and we get harvest. Amen. I'm going to close with a verse. John 15, verse 7. Jesus said this. If, by the way, circle the word if and write in your Bible, conditional promise. This is a conditional promise. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. The Father, look right here. This is not a prosperity teaching moment. I'm not talking about money. He says, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. How many of you just want to bear fruit? When I show up in heaven, I just want to be fruity. <laughs> I just want to have just fruit, like just bringing it in, right, with wagons. Just, there it is. I don't want to stand before the Lord on that day and have him say, you're saved, but you wasted your life. You're saved. You're coming in by the skin of your teeth, but man, you wasted your life. Those four things is how I measure a deep Christian. I don't measure the depth of somebody's walk with God because they told me an angel came and appeared to them. I don't. When people say, that guy's amazing, angels appear and talk to him, I'm like, okay. Maybe. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. Oh, this person had this manifestation of the Spirit in their life. And I go, well, that's cool. God does that. I believe in it. I believe God sends angels to work on our behalf. The Bible says that it's true. But sometimes we get caught in that stuff and say, this is the depths of Christianity. And Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Pretty simple. I know really, 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 really spiritual people that aren't very healthy. I know really, really, I know people that flow in the gift of prophetic words unbelievably and they, they don't obey the Lord very much. I don't want to be that guy. Love him first and then guess what? He pours out his Holy Spirit. When you're walking in those four pillars that I just gave you, when he pours out his Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and the manifestations of the Spirit, you're healthy enough to handle that stuff. Amen? Amen. So if I'm hungry, which I am, <laughs> anybody else hungry? You're like, stop talking, man. It's 12.09. <laughs> if I'm hungry, I don't, when I'm driving down the road, I don't see the sign of my favorite restaurant. I don't even know what that would be. Salitos. Anybody been to that place yet? Woo! Woo. Mexican. Fat Maddie's. If I'm, if I'm seeing Fat Maddie's sign and I go, yeah. I don't drive up and run up and climb the pole and start eating the sign. <laughs> the sign merely points me to the source. Signs and wonders point us to the source. They are not the meal. They just point us to somebody bigger and something better. It's pointing us, and by the way, there are signs and wonders that happen for the good of people, because God loves people. He wants them healed, blessed, and delivered. But so we get so into the signs that then we aren't mature here. We're not mature. God wants you to be deep, 
but he wants you to be maturely deep. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray.